Hi, everyone. I just want to introduce Nicole Kelly Westman, Tutu and A's Education and Learning Programmer, who will start us off today with um, a territorial acknowledgement. Hi, um, I'm Nicole Kelly Westman. Um, and uh, on the slide here, we have um, a work by Wes Harmon uh, that's currently a, um, installed at the Vancouver Art Gallery and some, some links that I'll, I'll speak about. So I'll, I'll just get started this morning with um, our land acknowledgement. <clears throat> this is the time uh, we need to mourn with our Indigenous relatives. It's with great grief that we recognize that the land itself is holding within it the loss of loved Suquamish children. Oral stories about the magnitude of this loss have been told for generations by survivors of the residential school system. And only uh, now was it proven through Western science with ground uh, radar investigations. For those of you calling in from outside of Canada, we've included a set of articles to contextualize this devastating news. The loss, these lost children were not able to grow up and tend to their communities, care for their kin, or bring love and delight to those, surround, or to those surrounding them. Rather, their absence has left a void of endlessly echoing and ricocheting grief. The truth of this nation's history is one of genocide. It's one of greed. All guests, of this unceded and unsurrendered land need to sit with the discomfort of this tragedy and think critically about what to do to show up for your Indigenous hosts. The work of reconciliation should not be left to Indigenous folks to sort through on their own. I tend to write my land acknowledgement as specific celebrations of place to remind myself and audience attendees of the significance in the uniqueness of varying ecosystems but I can't think of ways to celebrate the land when I can only think about how long she has been grieving, how long she has been waiting for restitution or justice. Please, should you have the financial means, I would ask you to redirect surplus resources you might have to provide support to Indigenous folks through this harrowing trauma. In this slide is a list of resources for you to support the Suquamish Nation and other Indigenous groups protecting their territories from ongoing colonization and displacement in act by the Government of Canada and British Columbia. We've also included additional resources for you to learn further about the industrial exploitation of old growth forests, most specifically the Fairy Creek watershed, which is currently being protected by frontline activists and many brave Indigenous youth and land defenders. We'll paste uh, the links in the chat as well. And if you're uh, based in Vancouver, uh, there is um, going to be a memorial this evening, um, meeting um, out front where Wes's work is um, shown in the slide um, at 6 p.m. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Justin McKee and I'm the Head of Strategy at 221A. I lead the organization's research, programming, communications and advancement. Um, thank you, Nicole, for your territorial acknowledgement and sharing where we're at uh, in Canada this week with a heavy heart and a, and a wounded psyche. Um, just allow me to change my slide. Um, the topic of our conversation today is around the potential for new arrangements of information, value, culture and resources for our generation and afterwards. As we look ahead to meeting the challenge of instigating much needed changes, I just wanted to take a minute to recognize the crucial research partner of 22NA on this overall blockchains and cultural padlocks research, um, who is uh, Chinook X. Um, and they've been uh, tremendously important. Oh, I don't have a slide for them, sorry. Um, oh, there it is. Um, it's Chinook X, and they've been tremendously important contributor to the values of our strategy. Um, by programming uh, culturally informed data sovereignty protocols for Indigenous communities, they're advancing an incredible vision for reciprocity and territorial stewardship. Relating across communities, species, and cultures is expressed through the blockchain design for energy and land management. They provide a compelling glimpse of uh, the emerging importance of the bioregional layer and our planetary scale network arrangements. So what Chinook X is planning to do is to operate data centers for Indigenous data sovereignty with a network of Indigenous utilities, green energy, and film and gaming and industry partners. Um, so they're asking the question, how can Indigenous values and protocols be expressed through blockchain design? Um, indigenous nations, uh, 
have the jurisdictional authority and the fortitude to accelerate our transformation um, towards better energy production. And they're looking to work with smart grid um, and renewable energy distribution to provide a real-time supply and demand of energy within a region, which could be really transformational. Um, we're gathered here today for a program that's part of the launch of 221A's digital strategy titled Blockchains and Cultural Padlocks. We've just completed our research phase of the initiative and have published a research report of our findings, values, and recommendations. We convened a research cluster to investigate the potential of blockchains as an institutional technology, and through this collective work, a freely, uh, freely available 200-page PDF was produced. <clears throat> it includes papers that survey our culture's ability to enable a mass collaborative financial turn developed with new models for digital cooperativism. The emergent strategy is to enable the conditions for recommoning land, data, and objects through the development of responsive and resilient asset sharing, power distributing, and value generating networks. We're supported by the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund, which awarded a multi-year grant to 221A in the organizational transformation stream of its awards. This funding program, which awarded grants from 2018 to 21, supported strategic initiatives that will help artists, groups, and organizations better understand the digital world, engage with it, and respond to the cultural and social changes it's producing. Um, for those of you who are joining us uh, from Berlin, I think we have a bit of a Berlin contingent today because of our guests, um, Patricia Reed and uh, Wasim El Sindi. I just wanted to give you a brief uh, introduction to 221A. Um, we were a nonprofit organization that uh, was initiated as a student club at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, which is the art and design school um, here in Vancouver, named after a famous Canadian painter. Um, and uh, we were founded as a nonprofit society um, in 2007 um, after the students have graduated and they moved out and um, our co-founders who are still working with us, Brian McBay and Michelle Fu, who are the respective uh, executive director and um, head of finance and equity, um, they had family connections in Vancouver's Chinatown, which is where um, they rented space um, to share studios and provide a small gallery in the front and we've grown from there. Um, our mission is to work with artists and designers to research and develop social, cultural, and ecological infrastructure. And we have a vision for all people um, to have the means to make and access culture. Um, so we're a distributed organization with multiple cultural properties throughout the city. Um, it's about 83 studios in total. Uh, we work with 150 artists through a cost recovery uh, model. Um, and uh, that, that kind of collective model allows us to, to operate these um, cultural facilities at uh, below market rates for commercial property in our city, um, which is, um, has many, many barriers to people who don't have extraordinary uh, revenues. Um, so in total, we have about um, 150 artists. Uh, that work with us. There are five nonprofit and small business retail units in this network. Um, there's a totaling, it totals about 55,500 square feet or 5,200 square meters. And then our artistic program is comprised of a fellowship program. Um, we work with artists and designers to research and develop social, cultural, and ecological infrastructure. Um, and those, uh, what we do in the fellowships is we provide the, the fellows with um, living wage salaries um, for long term projects that can range uh, from six months to two years in length. Um, we also have our research initiatives like this one, the Blockchains and Cultural Padlocks Initiative, and our other research initiative at the moment is a cultural land trust study um, for the city of Vancouver, and we're about to move into business planning for that project, which is very exciting, but we'd like to plan out a different future for our organization and our sector here in uh, Vancouver and British Columbia in the next decade. Um, and then we also produce education and learning programs, which is what Nicole Kelly Westman works with us on. Um, and finally, we produce public art at a site uh, that's titled Semi Public, also based in Chinatown. And we presently have a major work there um, that's called the Hao Shui in Squamish or Song Song Lom in Cantonese. Um, and it's a work by Toya Tanana Sis Weiss, who is a um, ethnobotanist and artist of Squamish, Stolo, Hawaiian and Swiss um, heritage. Um, and she worked with a group of youth um, to, to plant and develop this site with indigenous species um, to the Pacific Northwest coast. And the site continues to be stewarded to this day by a youth cohort um, who lead us um, in, in, in how to program and how to care um, for that site. And it's, uh, it's been a very valuable site for us throughout the pandemic and it's been keeping us and hopefully our neighborhood um, a little bit healthier. 
Um, today we're joined by Patricia Reed, uh, who is an artist uh, researcher on the project, um, and she wrote the paper, The Valuation of Necessity, included in our report. I'd like to thank Tutu and his board president, Am Johal, for introducing me to Patricia's work in 2015. This was before I worked for Tutu and A and before Am was on our board. Um, but uh, and it was through her contribution to the Accelerationist Reader with her text, Seven Prescriptions for Accelerationism. As well, we have Rosemary Heather, the initiative's editorial director, um, and Moral Sudahenia, a critical geographer who was also a researcher on our Blockchains and Cultural Padlocks project. And finally, we're joined by Wasim al Sindi, who studies the ecological and social impacts of blockchain technologies at large scales. Please allow me a moment to formally introduce our guest today because our backgrounds and our training and our studies are so varied. I think it'll be a very rich conversation, but I think it helps to have an idea of where everyone's coming from. Um, Patricia Reed is an artist, writer, and designer based in Berlin. Her writings have been published in Angelaki 24, Making and Breaking, Para Platforms, published by Sternberg, Post Meme, published by Punctum Books, which is forthcoming, Eflux Architecture, Zeno Architecture, published by Sternberg Press, Cold War, Cold World, published by Urg Ur Urbanomic, uh, and Distributed, published by Open Editions. Uh, Reed is also part of the Laboria Cubonics, a techno-material feminist working group, whose Zeno Feminist Manifesto, originally authored in 2015, was reissued by Verso Books in 2018. You can find out more at her website, aestheticmanagement.com, all one word, aesthetic management. Uh, Rosemary Heather is an art journalist, a curator, and a researcher with a specialization in blockchain. She writes about art, the moving image, and digital culture for numerous publications, artist monographs, and related projects internationally. From 2003 to 2009, Rosemary was the editor of C Magazine, published from Toronto. Since 2015, she's worked in the blockchain industry as a writer and a researcher. Her clients have included Wellpath.me, BitBlocks Technologies, Pegasus Fintech, Block Geeks. Bitcoin Magazine, Decentral, an archive of her writing can be found at rosemheather.com. Morale Sudahenia is a PhD candidate in the University of Victoria's Department of Geography. Her research investigates the cultural politics and commodification of digital and urban spaces shaped by global policies, peer-to-peer -peer systems, and smart technologies. Equally influence, influencing her scholarship are contemporary approaches to critical data studies, feminist political economy, and new materialist scholars that foreground questions surrounding access, citizenship, embodiment, financial exclusion, social justice, and subjectivities in relation to multi-scalar decision-making processes. Her doctoral research project, uh, in, supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, traces an ethnography of contemporary life under distributed but rambunctious instances of capitalism generated by blockchains and cryptocurrency markets. And Wasim al Sindi is the founder and host of Zero X Salon, conducting experiments in post disciplinary collective knowledge practices. The Zero X Salon, acting as an event series for regular discourse, provides an informational space for unstructured discussions of unusual topics and collectively authored outputs based on these conversations. A veteran of the blockchain space, Wasim currently works on conceptual design and philosophy of crypto economic systems at Block Science. In addition to writing and editorial responsibilities for various publications, including the MIT Computational Law Report. Prior to MIT, he was an independent researcher formulating novel approaches to the characterization of cryptographic assets and networks, such as the regulatory epistemology project, Token Space. Wasim has also curated avant-garde arts events, led a creative engineering laboratory, and published open source ex experimental electronic music. Originally with research specializations in the physical science, Wasim holds a PhD in ultra-fast supermolecular photophysics from the University of Nottingham in England, alongside degrees in chemistry, astrophysics, and finance. As I mentioned earlier, our conversation today is around Patricia's commissioned research paper, The Valuation of Necessity. This text takes a deep look at the conceptual constraints that increasingly are providing lethal to life on this planet. Her two-part paper examines the social continuation of necessity as a normative and epistemic referent or orienting the uses and abuses of technology within this historical moment designated as the planetary. The paper is illustrated with a series of diagrams drawn by the artist, adding a further conceptual dimension to the cosmology of concepts and ideas that the writer travels through. 
by asking questions about what conditions are needed to cognize worlds that do not yet exist, we will consider the relevance of blockchain technology beyond tech startup orthodoxy. Our intentions are to get a view into the ways that this technology might capture the imagination and what its future applications might be in an art and design context and beyond. And finally, um, we are working with a closed captioner today uh, called Vitac, so you can turn that on um, for your feed um, if, if, if you require that. Um, I'll hand it over now to Patricia to tell us more about her paper. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So you can hear me okay now, I think? Yeah, fantastic. Um, thanks so much for organizing this. And, uh, you know, it's just have to put a shout out to 221A for being such a great um, collaborator on all this and, and extremely patient and uh, understanding through uh, less than ideal working situations. I think we were all not operating at the same cognitive speed, <laughs> even if we were in a, in a privileged place during the pandemic, sitting at home and in relative um, security. And uh, also a big shout out to Rosemary for her, uh, you know, editing on the fly of the text as it went. Uh, it took a long time and uh, extremely, always a, lovely, a great editor to work with. So very grateful. Um, also to Maral for agreeing to join tonight. And I encourage all of you to read her, her piece. I believe you have an event coming up as well, focusing specifically on, I don't want to scare you, but uh, everyone should watch that. And, uh, and uh, to Wasim for agreeing to um, join. It's also a momentous occasion because I think it's the first time I'm doing a talk uh, with another actual <laughs> human with, with pants on and, um, <laughs> and uh, since like over a year. So it's very, we're, we're starting to feel a little bit of optimism here in Berlin. Um, Nature's so healing. We hope that, I, I want this optimism to travel obviously much further. Uh, and also to trust for uh, allowing us to use the space uh, and you don't have to stare at my boring uh, living room. Uh, and to a scene for setting up this kind of fun setup. So basically, um, I'm going to try to summarize my paper. Uh, it is going to be a bit dense and difficult because it is a long one. Um, and we don't want to take all the time because I really want to take this opportunity to enjoy the um, discussion with Wasim, Rosemary, and Morale. Um, uh, and so basically, I'm going to go for around 25, 30 minutes. Then we're going to uh, hear uh, responses uh, from Maral, Rosemary, and Wasim. And then we will wrap up the discussion uh, and hopefully be able to take questions online if there is a desire for such a thing. Um, so yeah, um, maybe I can switch into slide mode now. Switch the screen. Yes, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. This is the great thing about having a having a colleague right beside you and who knows what he's doing it's, having, having a de facto system it's amazing <laughs> i'll get used to it um so yeah so basically um the the contribution to my research project is more of a sort of a general reflection on the techno uh social scene so i will just go to here um uh yeah basically sort of like a general reflection on the techno social configuration of worlds in consideration of the human who cannot be separated from technical activities. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to go into all the details. As I mentioned, it's quite a long paper, but I'm gonna do my best to summarize in this kind of condensed time. Um, but just to say, I think the central problem uh, that I'm working through in the essay, and obviously won't claim to have answered it, um, is how does the social reasoning of necessity manifest? And how can it change in order to establish new um, valences of ethical operational, epistemological, uh, and axiological orientation for the construction of worlds that do not yet maximally exist. So hopefully that question will also, you know, some of the terms may not be all that clear right now, but hopefully that will become more uh, lucid as we go on. So it's just to say that it's not really like, it's not as specific on blockchain, although there is some mention at the end. However, I think that's also best left in the hands of, of uh, you know, of the, my esteemed colleagues tonight who have, you know, spent years uh, working and thinking on it, right? It would be disingenuous for me to jump in and think I have something to add to that specific conversation. So I'm trying to learn alongside. Um, so basically to say that the question is kind of, it's inherently cosmological as the, uh, as the sort of title of the event alludes to. And when I say cosmological, I'm kind of relying on the definition of, of cosmology that Bentley Allen, uh, an international relations scholar, um, mapped out where it's essentially composed between five interwoven factors. So ontology, epistemology, um, uh, 
temporality, so the direction and quality of time, uh, cosmogony, uh, and destiny, or the role or situation of humanity in the cosmos. So that's this kind of five-part, you know, cosmological disposition. So just to be clear, uh, the, the understanding of necessity that I'm working from here isn't uh, necessarily like, it's not this like hyper-formalistic one, um, is what we can think of as non-alethic necessity. So that is an artificial necessity that is only a necessity relative uh, to certain fabricated conditions, and so it is not absolute. So we're talking about the social construction of necessity here. And uh, so although non-alethic necessities are, of course, mutable, uh, the operations of power and organizational reinforcement at work in stabilizing social orders can be described as procedures of naturalizing necessity, right? So we want to keep that idea in mind. So when non-alethic necessities become naturalized, a shared social sense of what is immutable um, or what is simply not negotiable emerges, uh, and that becomes part of the experience of, uh, of what we experience as a total or complete, you know, unchangeable system. And of course, what we experience is the consequence of an interplay between, you know, concrete material reality and the, uh, the um, uh, internalization or the psychic evaluation of those externalizations and sort of a feedback dynamic. So if the naturalization of necessity serves to uphold the, the social per perception of immutability, uh, non-alethic necessities can be seen as a conceptual constraint on the possibility space for social reconfiguration, right? They kind of block that, that, that sense that something other can, is possible. Um, so it's on this problem of systemic constraint, again, in material and cognitive levels, that uh, I've been turning to the polymath Sylvia Winter for, for help <laughs> on this problem, who has elaborately theorized the historical past that have led to our present condition, um, you know, beginning notably with the birth of European humanism. So roughly sort of we're looking at like Renaissance era. So as Winter describes it for the first time in human histories, uh, what Jesse was alluding to with the planetary. So the, for the first time in human histories, our condition is one of coexisting uh, in an environment in common, uh, albeit in disparate and in uncommon ways. And although Winter's project does not address technology specifically, right, she's not a thinker we normally associate with the, the technology uh, discourse, um, the historical condition she's describing and invested in is inseparable from technological activity. So I've been finding it very fruitful to to think about technologies through her way of understanding uh, systems and, and history. So I'm going to be, uh, I feel horrible for doing such a, a short overview of Winter because everyone should read her. Um, but to put it very succinctly, uh, for Winter, all societies, no matter their uh, historical and geographic specificity, um, they're governed primarily via the informal authority of an idealized human self-image. So while these self-idealizations are not the same, and of course they yield very different types of societies, the function of these human self-idealizations as a coordinating force is for Winter you know, universal. So Winter names these idealizations as genres of being human, and they kind of serve as a primary frame of reference for organizing practices and norms of social life. So genres of being human operate as a kind of non-alethic necessity in this regard, from which you know, epistemic, uh, economic, and normative orders cascade that establish both markers and conditions of selection and deselection, or conformance and non-conformance. So because this feedback dynamic uh, manifests in a kind of formal or institutional or informal normative ways, a reproductive system of self-reference emerges uh, that not only confirms, but incentivizes compliance with a particular genre of being human. So such a reproductive system of self-reference bends toward the structuring and evaluation of knowledge systems that confirms the, uh, the veracity or the, you know, the legitimacy or truth value of, said, of this human idealization. And this is what Catherine McKittrick has a uh, very succinctly called adaptive truths. 
So because of this consequential force of this self-referential system that Winter asserts that there can be no paradigmatic social transformation without a corresponding transformation in the genre of being human. So I think the additional question to that in the context of this program is like, we can then ask, you know, um, or, or keep in mind the question, you know, what role does technology play in this process, right? Um, does it play a role? And if so, what, what kind of role does it play? Oops. <laughs> Do I have to reactivate technology. it? Technology. <laughs> Great. Um, so to arrive at this model of self-referential, the internalizing, externalizing feedback dynamics, um, uh, Winter has been uh, influenced and adopted the, the model of sociogeny uh, developed by Franz Fanon in order to challenge what she, feel, what she sees as the social bio, as bio over determination or what we can think of as the naturalization of necessity, which is basically like using the excuse of nature to say, oh, humans are greedy and this is the best sort of system to organize, et cetera. It's, 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 it's legitimizing it based on some skewed idea of what a natural fact of the human is. So basically, sociogeny describes the feedback process between social structures and the internalization of them as a necessary category through which to account for the asymmetric conditions of being human. So these are conditions that cannot be captured by evolutionary or biological categories alone. So where phylogeny and ontogeny may offer explanations of what it is to be human, uh, Sociogeny offers a framework to explain what it is like to be human, which is very different since every since, since the human is indivisibly entrenched within a socially encoded milieu and obviously completely and equally so. So basically Fanon's intervention is to reject the possibility that even contemplating the human shorn of its social relations. So he comes to this drawing from the experience of anti black racism both in himself and through his practice as a psychiatrist working with patients in colonial conditions. So Fanon crucially noted that the overcoming of such structural trauma that is not only based on material oppressions, but also on the interiorization of inferiority on the part of the, uh, of, of the oppressed and superiority, internalization of superiority on the part of the oppressor, they cannot be premised on adapting to given social reality particularly one that is punitive or one that produces harms. Rather, the one requires, quote, an overall social transformation. So inherent to this cure, as it were, is a demand for self-conscious non-adaptation in order to rupture the perceived closure, naturalist, or veracity of a self-referential -refer system for ordering reality and human relations therein. So I'd just like to emphasize this concept of non-adaptation, which I think is an incredibly powerful uh, epistemic consequence that Sylvia Winter is also drawing from Fanon, but something that is very much uh, important for us to think through today, especially when we you typically describe a structure, a monolithic structure such as capitalism, we, we tend to think of it as a totalizing system. So how can we learn to, non, to think non-adaptively in relation to that, right? And, and, and you could even say that in a way like critique has to, even a form of critique can sometimes be adaptive because it has to keep pointing to that object. It doesn't necessarily think non-adaptively, even if it's against it. So, so through Winter's historical account, we can come to see our present condition as the global inflation of a once, uh, you know, locally specific Euro-modern genre of being human that's manifest now uh, as the naturalization of homo economicus. So this has its origins in 19th century European liberalism. And this figure has been legitimized upon natural grounds with the illusion of demythologizing the human, right? That was the other thing. So it's like the, pre the, <laughs> the premise of demythologizing the human uh, where rampant competition and therefore extreme resource inequity is purported to be our natural state. Uh, so what, what happens when the move is made to defend social orders upon natural or bio overdetermined um, grounds is not only the risk of instrumentally abusing scientific developments to furnish existing biases and structures of domination, but it's also a way to evacuate human history insofar as histories are mutable and not determinate. So Winter gives the name homo neurans to this um, uh, to describe this historically constituting praxis of being human 
uh, with her insistence that it's irreducible to being a noun, right? It's wrong to think about humanness as a noun. So Homo neurons describes the activity and the experience of being human as a hybrid of bios mythos or bios logoi uh, and describes the feedback dynamic between the two. And this is quite interesting because it's not unlike the artifactual theory of mind uh, that examines how like tool externalizations and their use uh, subsequently leave neurochemical uh, imprints on the brain, right? So there, it's, it's not that your brain is totally in your head even. <laughs> um, so to begin, thank you, <laughs> to begin diagnosing our present, it can be described as the effect of a Euromodern, modern, uh, monohumanist genre concept that figures itself as masterfully dominant over and separate from an infinitely plentiful passive ground that is merely there to serve the appetites of a human minority. Um, so this condition, as we stated earlier, uh, has yielded historical and material path dependencies necessitating coordination of coexistence both for and within an environment in common, uh, which we call the planetary. So this critical historical moment denotes a condition where, as the philosopher Yu Kui uh, notes, quote, humans are elevated to a causal explanatory category in the understanding of human history as a consequence of the culmination of a technological consciousness in which the human being starts to realize the decisive role of technology in the destruction of the biosphere and in the future of humanity, end quote. So it is a historical condition driven by the proliferation of a technological of technological externalizations that you know arise from this particular monohumanist genre concept, which today cannot be held apart from any contemporary social diagnostics. And so the uh, you know and so it must be added uh, to Fanon's uh, original formulation that besides phylogeny, ontogeny, and sociogeny there also stands technogeny. Oh, sorry, I'm a bit behind on the slides. <laughs> I'll leave that for a second while I catch up here. So, um, so right, so we end up with, we're adding now technogeny to this kind of sequence of, that was originally formulated by Fennel. Besides phylogeny, ontogeny, and sociogeny stands technogeny. So what is technogeny? So it's similar to the embedded principles of sociogeny uh, insofar as technogeny indexes this kind of co-evolutionary intermediaries through which proxies of being human are enabled and capacities for activity are transformed in productive or ambivalent or destructive uh, ways. Uh, so the point is to say one cannot speak of technology as a standalone uh, thing removed from its sphere of interactions or milieu and within a computationally complex historical condition, um, <laughs> hang on, uh, distinctions between sociogeny and technogeny collapse insofar as technology uh, can no longer be thought of as a mere means to fulfill, uh, you know, sociocultural ends, but instead has reached a degree of magnitude where, to quote, uh, to quote Huey, uh, machines are no longer simply tools or instruments, but rather gigantic organisms in which we live, end quote. So this is, of course, a bit similar to those familiar with uh, Benjamin Bratton's concept of the stack or model of the stack that also is, is about an account of computationally dimension, uh, planetary dimension computation. So this gigantic organismic scale, technologies are both a human machinic, uh, quote, relation to a milieu and a modification of it with successive modifications transforming the milieu itself and therefore the conditions of action for those within it, end quote. And that's in the words of Connor Heaney. So given the, the previous emphasis on, on uh, Winter's human genre concept operating as a determining force, it would of course be tempting to, to conclude that technology as a human making is simply an externalization of whatever referent human genre concepts happens to be governing a particular social configuration, right? That would be sort of the logical move. While this is kind of accurate to a certain degree, if we are to commit in an absolute sense to this position, it would entail adopting a view of technology that is totally subsumed by a given cultural context, where its particular technical, material, and protological uh, properties are of negligible import or consequence. 
So as Langdon Winter has noted, in such a social determination of technology view, taken to its logical end, quote, technical things do not matter at all, end quote, because technology is a result of social processes alone, right? So that way you also get this separation of uh, the object from human interaction. The flip side of that position would be to say that technology unto itself is the determining object uh, um, agent of social configurations, including political economy. So in this view, technology develops purely through internal workings um, and it shapes society in its image. So while the, the former picture technology is the effect of a particular social order, whereas the latter technology is the causal force of a particular social order. So while I think both of these positions continue to play out uh, quite a bit in particularly humanities discourses on technology, uh, Gilbert Simondon's influential work, which, which, which is not recent by the way, um, his influential work raises a stark warning uh, against such binary understanding and rather adopts an analysis of technics operationally. So that's as both cause and effect, um, as structure and process, similar to the recursivity at work in sociogeny, right? So there's a nice analogy in terms of like operations here. Okay, for Simon Don, technics refers to the broad domain of techniques, process, technologies, and various practices that are both conceptual and material through which human, uh, humans interact and refashion their milieu, along with, of course, the psychosocial effects of uh, those interactions. So we're gonna move a little quicker here. <laughs> Thank you. So techniques, according to Catherine Hales, is the quote, study of how technical objects emerge, solidify, disassemble, and evolve. While machines may operate as an intermediary between human and its environment, the operations of intermediation that flow and shape conditions in both directions place techniques squarely within the domain of, of ecology, right? Um, so ecology can be broadly understood as a study of coexistence and not mere existence. It is, as Hue noted, a quote, new condition of philosophizing with the recognition that our present techno-social condition can be described as the quote, becoming organic of the inorganic, end quote. And what this means is that it's increasingly the inorganic that constitutes our environmental condition for coexistence. Yeah. <laughs> so while Simon Don distinguishes mere tools from technical objects, um, Catherine Hales raises a problem for this. Uh, and she sort of bases her reasoning on anthropological definitions. And she just says uh, uh, that tools are, are part of, she, she suggests that tools are part of techniques um, because a tool stated generally is quote, an artifact used to make other artifacts. So considering the premise that a technical object is an artifact used to make other artifacts, we can say that a technical object is not just the concrete thing unto itself, but also includes the not yet concretized possibility for its repurposing or retooling into something else. Uh, in this way, technical objects must contain the possibility of other use and signification that may not be immediately apparent within a given conceptual framework or milieu. That said, however, <laughs> uh, falling into a delirium of possibility idealism, because technical objects always contain within them a degree of indeterminacy, would be to ignore uh, the concrete and operational constraints also endemic to them that set limits on what is realizably possible. So as Ramon Amaro has noted, quote, we can, be, uh, <laughs> we can be contingent, but only within the limits of the protocols that we interact with, end quote. So otherwise said, the possible retooling of technical objects is not infinitely open, right? Technical objects matter. <laughs> uh, so Anil, the theorist Anil Bawakavia has in, it, in another context, summarized such a premise in logical terms known as the Barkhand formula. Quote, the possibility of the existence of A implies the existence of the possibility of A, end quote. 
Here, the possibility of the existence A necessarily requires the existence of the possibility of A. However, on a practical note, it must be observed that the existence of possibility A may be undetectable or difficult to recognize because of that adaptive, normative, epistemic, and cognitive conditions within which humans interact with technology in habit-forming ways, right? We, so a lot of these possibilities are, are ob obscured to, for us. So for Wendy Hui Kyung Chun, uh, habits with regards to communications technology, specifically new media, are described as behaviors and quote, things that remain by disappearing from consciousness, end quote. And that which has disappeared from consciousness impedes upon the intelligibility of the existence of possibility otherwise, right? We just don't see it. So we can then say that the prerequisite conditions for the transformability of any technical object are dependent on the capacity for practical and conceptual uh, dehabituation in order to construct perspectives that are amenable to making those imminent possibilities intelligible, right? Those realizable possibilities. How do we learn to see them without falling into the trap of what I call possibility idealism, right? Where it's just infinitely open. So can I change? Oh. Pretty. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the problem of witnessing the existence of the possibility of A traces back to Winter's engagement with the question of historical discursive and scientific paradigm shifts. Uh, she, she thinks a lot through the work of, of Michel Foucault and Thomas Kuhn, who are probably familiar for, for most of you. Um, and then the problem of reinforced adaptation or habituation to their operational ordering. So parsed through Winter's framework, the possibility of witnessing the existence of the possibility of A within a given paradigm that of course obfuscates the perceptibility of possibility A is a problem tied to the perception of quote, the grammar of regularities, end quote, that institute a boundary condition that enclose what can be thought of as normalized possibility, right? Possibility that is like permitted within a given system without disturbing it. And I think a lot of technology that labels itself disruptive is completely in that in that genre, <laughs> um, um, in contrast to possibility as such. So normalized possibility can be translated as probability, specifically the hegemony of probability calculations that govern much of techno-social reality today, uh, for which probability operates as, quote, the entropic tendency uh, towards the elimination of the diverse, end quote. And that's in the words of Bernard Stiegler. So for Winter, the question of witnessing emerges from the perspectival category of the liminal, insofar as a structural contradiction can be understood or experienced between the representational order that prescribes parameters of behavioral coexistence and lived or empirical reality that is unaccounted for within that representational grammar. So if we map this into Stiegler, the liminal corresponds to the category of the improbable insofar as the improbable resists calculation within a given framework, which furthermore deals a blow to the concept of information as a mere result of calculation. So this is gonna be a kind of a crucial point because um, I may have to, uh, for the sake of time, like uh, cut things a bit short. Um, hang on here, where am I here? Uh, so epistemic or paradigm shifts occur not only as the critical recognition of the existence of possibility A, right, the acknowledging or pointing to something, but the risky realization for possibility A, driven by this historically constituting figure of homo neurons. And the term for such transformative shifts in referential frameworks is an other world. And its coming into maximal existence is dependent on the risky process of constructing an improbable vantage point that is never given in advance and is isomorphic with what can be thought of as a non-adaptive perspective. How are we doing for time, uh, Jesse? Because I realize we're getting a bit late here. Things are running a bit long. So should I wrap up and we can move on? If you um, just want to give a little sign. Yeah, I think if you feel okay to move on at this point, um, and then maybe the rest of us can just kind of speak to some of the paper yeah, questions. let's do. Why don't I? Why don't I stop at non-adaptive perspective? Because I think I've been talking for too long, and it's quite dense. And I really want to make sure that everyone has enough time to, with their own uh, 
really good contribution. So why don't I stop at that? The paper's online anyways. Anyone's free to read and, of course, get in touch if they have any questions or whatever. So I'll stop there and, and we can move on to, uh, I believe, I'm giving the floor over to you, Meryl. That's right. Thanks, Patricia. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry that you had to truncate um, your, your paper. Um, I was quite, it was riveting. <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, uh, but I'm mindful of time. So I'll try to keep my, my comments um, pretty short so that I can make space for others to, to contribute. Um, and uh, just before I start it, I wanna just um, uh, thank Patricia for, for really just a, such an engaging paper and by engaging I mean I was able to engage with it um, in a way that um, was really nourishing um, you know when um, reading your paper and, and all the contributions um, often when you get this kind of feeling that you want to sit with something with a text really long um, for me that's that's pretty special I don't um, you know often read a lot and kind of just go through it and go, yeah, yeah okay this is interesting whatever good concepts um, but uh, your, your paper was really tasty it was like a good meal that I wanted to slow down and, and enjoy and so I went back to it quite a bit um, and it was really nice to kind of see it come alive um, so thank you for, for the opportunity to be able to kind of um, speak to it to some degree though I, I don't think uh, I'll, I'll do any service um, and uh, also want to take a moment and just uh, really give a shout out to um, to Jesse and, and Tao 221A in particular and, and Rosemary who edited um, my paper um, and uh, yeah I just what a, a nourishing project entirely um, I guess you know in terms of kind of starting with so I've got a slide but I'm mindful of time and that maybe by the time that I figure out how to share it and I was kind of joking but not really before this I'll see if I can actually, um, that uh, I, I got a little bit panicked knowing that there would be slides with people who are artistic um, because I'm certainly not. Um, so I kind of had like an attempt at some kind of visual um, thing here um, just, and, and really kind of what I'm trying to show you is, is um, the, the conceptual ballast that I'm using to kind of frame my, my discussion today. Uh, this image is of obviously a house with a key um, and it relates to um, the, the paper that I wrote for, um, for this project, um, which deals with fractional real estate applications um, and blockchains. So I can get to kind of what the connection is there with, with Patricia's work, um, as well as um, this um, bit of text to the right, um, which really, uh, and thanks again to Patricia for um, really, providing kind of a nice prompt, I think, to think about how to start talking about these things. And, and one of the, the beauties, I think, of your, um, of your paper and, and diagrams is that, yeah, you don't really focus too much on the tech, which is, I think, really a big trap that we run into when we um, start talking about digital technologies um, in, in critical ways. Um, but, you know, this notion, for instance, that um, thinking about kind of what do we mean by kind of um, evaluation and value um, when it comes to land is something that that's been really kind of um, forefront for me um, in the past few years. Um, and so yeah, so Patricia suggests I frame my response really kind of surrounding kind of this notion of valuation um, of land um, in proprietary terms, and especially I think um, as we kind of think of the ideological constraints to democratizing state. Um, and so what does that mean in the context of, of, of blockchains? Um, and what does it have to do with the silly picture that I perhaps, it's not silly, but I'm perhaps silly in my interpretation of it, um, that I've, I've put here today. Um, and so, you know, the, the focus of kind of the, uh, this notion of land evaluation, I think is really prominent for everyone, no matter where you are. It's particularly intensified if you're in one of these kind of um, uh, global real estate markets that are really illiquid and really hyper-valued um, and extremely exclusive. So, you know, I'm calling in today from Lekwungen territory, um, which, you know, relies on the colonial um, toponym of, of Victoria, British Columbia, um, where, you know, our median house price is over a million dollars, <laughs> which is kind of ridiculous, I think. Uh, and and I, I doubt that that's even um, uh, the highest median uh, price for folks on this call today from those of you calling in from Vancouver and, and probably Berlin as well um, and elsewhere. So one of the things that, you know, I was really interested in, in, in kind of looking at your paper and, and also kind of trying to connect the dots with, with mine is that I focus on kind of this question of, of fractional real estate applications with blockchains. And, you know, with the blockchain, we tend to kind of be obsessed with these questions of value that I think you rightfully kind of interrogate. Um, and often they kind of slip into these kind of discussions of, you know, subjective or objective theories of value, um, specifically relating to cryptocurrencies um, to highlight kind of, and I think that highlights the indeterminacy of, of technologies in the way that you frame them. Um, 
but you know, and we see this notion that you take up, Patricia, um, specifically through uh, Hale's framing of technics, um, or this retooling, I think, and it's a really nice way to put it, uh, this retooling of um, uh, you know technical objects or, or, or technologies that I think becomes really evident in blockchain discourses and material materiality. Sorry, um, and the latter here, you know, really refers to actual projects or platforms, protocols um, that, that blockchains enact. Um, and, and this is specifically around kind of, I think, the way that blockchains can retool land as something else. Um, and, you know, they, they tend to kind of enact land as, as these different, um, sometimes really evident um, assets or, or kind of forms of property, um, but also in unanticipated ways as, as kind of a shared or universal good, um, as sacred spaces. Um, and so, you know, when you think about kind of the evaluation of land um, and, and valuing as a gerund, um, and particularly in relation to kind of the blockchain and some of the concepts you've brought up, um, you know, this you kind of think about a variety of references. These kind of can collide quite a bit. And one of them would be, I think, Anne Marie Mole and Frank Hertz call. Um, you know, the monetary res register. This is the one that I think we tend to think of when we think of blockchains, kind of the general normative context um, of the technology um, through kind of uh, the, the possibility of A, if you will, to, to riff on your paper a little bit. Um, and, and this is where we see kind of um, the most slipperiness, I think, right, of, well, obviously we want to be able to use um, land and enclose it um, so that it becomes kind of these first, second, and third order assets, right? First is in kind of um, typical kind of deeds, um, property relations as we know them that are dispossessive, extractive, um, and lead to kind of an illiquid accumulation of wealth. Um, but then there are these second and third orders that I think become evident through the blockchain and are quite seductive to people who are falling into that, I think you call it, um, uh, the drawing on Linus Schwartz's work, uh, the digital medalist approach um, that is highly individualist, that's um, predicated on kind of, um, you know, price signals in the market and, and catalaxy, I think is the term that you use. Um, and, and here, this is really where it's really interesting because those second and third orders of kind of um, uh, wealth accumulation um, become really, really um, seductive to people who, who want to be able to um, gain additional private wealth and maximize it um, uh, under the guise of sovereignty and individualism. And by this, I mean, like in terms of that second order, so you've got, you know, the property um, relations and, and how it functions essentially as kind of a, a, a monetizable asset in some ways, finance really. Um, and then you've got the second order of kind of the token, if you will, if it's related to a blockchain fractional um, real estate app, which really to summarize what those are is essentially kind of taking a piece of property and then partitioning different shares of it. Um, and this is kind of often promoted in a way that um, is seen to kind of provide a, a lower barrier to entry to finance. Um, and then the third order might be kind of this question of rentier capitalism where blockchain um, applications that try to partition property and make it kind of more available to a wider network of consumers um, really kind of rely on this, these discourses of um, uh, rentiership and, and remittances, um, where, for instance, if I participate in this particular platform that is redistributing wealth um, and democratizing land in some ways, because it's no longer extremely exclusive to become a property owner, I can have a share, then I have the deed. Um, and then I also have kind of the speculative kind of component that comes with that deed. Um, because property um, provides us with equity that can be um, financialized. Um, but then I also have the potential to be able to either rent to own um, or, you know, receive remittances from those renters um, that, that are um, essentially kind of inhabiting um, the, the land itself uh, that has now been kind of essentially kind of expressed through a token or a share or both. Um, and so that's a really kind of interesting thing that you tap into um, because you know it collides with this other side of it and I'm mindful of time here so I'll wrap it up quickly, um, which is kind of um, these non-adaptive ways of thinking about land and its valuation um, that I think often become really challenging to think about in the context of these technologies and specifically blockchains. Um, which have to do with kind of more of a, a mutualist approach. And I think you rely on, on the term, um, or you invoke the term, sorry, um, infrastructural mutualism, right? This, this notion that actually we can think or evaluate land as something that is mutual, as a shared good, as collective, um, as these kind of nodal transformations that require care. And, um, you know, to, to paraphrase um, Tanya Lee Murray, um, land is something that is not to be rolled up like a mat, right? It's something that you tend to and weed and, and, and um, sacred and, and is home uh, or community. 
Um, and and th this becomes really interesting in the context of these, these blockchain applications because um, you have these kind of capillary um, projects that come up and try to do this. And I think um, one of uh, the participants in the blockchains and uh, cultural padlocks project DOMA uh, is an excellent example of this where, you know, they're trying to essentially kind of um, leverage kind of valuing property land as property in the kind of normative individualist sense or digital metalist sense, if you will, um, to allow for these non-adaptive realities to, to perhaps, uh, or imaginaries to come to fruition, where they're essentially hacking property to provide um, collectivist forms of equity that can then um, uh, actually lower the barriers to, um, uh, you know, using land in, in a variety of ways. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm, I'm just, I don't know where we're at for time, Jesse, I can keep going, but I also don't want to just um, monopolize the space. Uh, so I'm going to rely on you to tell me to to do like kind of the figurative cane on stage and pull me out. Um, <laughs> Can I just add one thing? Can I just add one thing quickly? Because yeah. I just want to give credit where credit is due. And so these terms like digital, um, uh, digital me uh, um, metalism. metalism and uh, infrastructural mutualism. mutualism, these are from Lana Schwartz essay. So not my terms. Yes. And I just want to make sure that everyone is aware that we're, we're culling from her, <laughs> her <laughs> oeuvre for, for our, uh, Think for our own thoughts so just to be clear <laughs> yeah, her papers are amazing i think they're required reading for everyone in the space especially the ones that are looking at this more the, the imaginaries and the technosocial side yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, thank you for um clarifying that I, I don't know if i was particularly clear but yes the um your invocation i guess of, of lana Swartz's terms is uh, but it, i think it's a really useful framing because it, it, this, these two kind of um concepts really are always in tension already, I think, with blockchains, and particularly when we think about kind of the valuation of land. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges is that if, because I think we see so much of the, the, the digital metalist or really individualist kind of um, capitalism as we understand it today, uh, kind of circulating in, in, in a lot of kind of mainstream discourses, it becomes really hard, I think, to um, not only imagine kind of those alternatives um, and those futures that are perhaps more collectivist and, and perhaps a lot more um, driven by some of the ideas that I think you're trying to take up. Um, and, and it's really, really challenging to, um, to, to see that. But um, I think your paper really allows us to kind of think critically about how we can make those spaces possible um, and how we can kind of sit with those projects um, and, and not try to kind of always bring them back into that space of um, uh, the kind of more hegemonic approach to, to, to evaluating land. Um, and, and so for me, kind of one of the things that I continue to grapple with is, you know, um, how do we evaluate land uh, in the context of, I think what you call the global game, right? Um, and, and how do we kind of use the blockchain to hack um, some of these more, um, I think, normative capitalist ways of being um, and, and maybe kind of allow for those alternative spaces to come about um, so yeah, I, I know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm mindful of time and I think I might have talked more than my allotted amount. Um, so I'm happy to perhaps just be quiet now and, and, and pass it over. Um, was, thank you so much. That was really great. And uh, maybe we'll jump over to Rosemary and uh, give her the floor, but thank you so much. Are you ready, Rosemary? Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That was great, um, Patricia and Morale. And thanks for this uh, luminous thinking around these topics. I'm going to share my screen. Um, present, uh, take from beginning. Is that what it does? That that's okay. So, can you guys see that? Not yet. No, not yet. Okay, here it is. So, can you see that? Yep, that's coming through. Yep. Okay. So, um, I'll just try to go through this quickly and um, to, it's, it's really, I'm just looking at the one aspect of crypto that it, it does pertain to Patricia's essay in the sense that, um, how do I make this slide get bigger? Let's go up to the but, top. 
the top right, or sorry, top left, and it should say from beginning, just below there. There's a little icon. Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, about what we, the self-imposed constraints we operate under and, um, you know, is there something in blockchain technology? And I'm going to speak about, yeah, the, the technology, contrary to what Patricia was saying, but that enables us, that, that, that has something, is there something different going on there? And, and I'm just going to put in these really simple terms because I, the thing that interests me is, is I find that it's, there's, there's something peculiar going on and I sort of struggle to explain it. And also, trying to get other people kind of interested uh, saying like look over here like this is this something's going on over here um but it's sort of a slow process um but so i wrote about staking um which is the proof of stake protocols proposes of alternative to the current protocol which is very en energy intensive um and so what the way it operates is that nodes you you deposit crypto um and run a node on the network and that is a way to make the data on the network more secure the more nodes the there are the more secure the data is so um and then you earn dividends in exchange for your um deposit uh so there's another i'll just skip this and um so the thing i want to talk about is this feedback loop and there's this kind of saying like users of the protocol own the protocol or users of the network own the network. Um, so it's this, this idea. Uh, so you have to network native tokens that are used to secure the network. Uh, the more nodes there are, the more security, the better the health of the protocol, the better the health of the, the token. Um, and that feedback loop has made people uh, a lot of people got a lot richer based on that um yeah that feedback loop so yeah it's this is this thing that's kind of peculiar because you're it's owning the network token you're investing in the protocol too and this is an often talk about idea related with the uh, blockchain networks of, of decentralization. Um, and I, I only recently, I think, came to understand what it meant. Um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding um, about what decentralization means. Uh, but at, at, at the basic level, it's peer-to-peer -peer internet transactions that are possible. So they're not going through any kind of centralized entity. Um, but the way in which I w have been able to understand it or explain it to other people, there's two ways. So like everybody's working at scale because this is a massive project. Um, they're investing in the token. That means they're investing in the network. They're pursuing their own interest and then together they're making value, which they can take out. It's a feedback loop. Um, another way to think of it is it's another version of creating user generated content on the network, which is what everybody does on Facebook, etc. Um, so we're all we all have these behaviors are very um, well established now of uh, uh, giving our labor to, for free to Mark Zuckerberg and uh, his ilk. Um, but with the blockchain network, the token is the content and the users capture all the value um, and not the platform. So I don't know, is that something that, uh, like does it create alternative social values, um, possibilities? Like, yes, maybe. Um, Facebook is a way that millions of people are coordinated uh, daily for good and for bad, as, as we found out. Um, and crypto does this as well, but it does it really at the speculative level of the value of, of tokens at this point, although there's a lot of experimentation happening about 
what else might be possible. Um, so I like to think of it as a medium of mass collaboration. Um, and it, up to date, it's not, it doesn't really get talked about in this way. And that might be because of the role that these centralized platforms play in our, our lives. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, on, in this mass collaboration, it's only in crypto networks do you earn value proportional to your investment. And I realize this is really very like a simplification, but that, that sort of a, describes a basic dynamic. Um, so, and then I just wanted to bring up an analogy. Uh, there's a fellow, Christina Battles uh, at 221A, and she's kind enough to ask me to write a text for her about mesh networks. Um, and I think that they are looking at establishing a, a mesh network um, at 221A uh, as part of Christina's project. And what it is, it's community run Wi Fi. Uh, so all you need is a couple, like the simplest one, you just need to put a router up at a, on the roof of your house. And so it has a sight line with another router and make that available to uh, other people who also, when they, when they add their routers, it keeps, the mesh keeps getting uh, bigger. And the, the example is, the best example is the Buifi net in the Catalonia, in the Valencia, and it extends beyond there. They have... 36,000 active nodes, um, so it's big. And on the website, they have uh, that phrase, you are wifi.net. So this is the thing that, that comes back to this thing is, is you you own the protocol when you buy the token. It's the same thing. And it's a it's a feature of network technology um, and black blockchain as well. Um, and so just to talk about Guifi, that those ideas, sort of anarchist ideas, or, or you know, these alternative ideas, they go deep. Um, revolutionary Catalonia uh, during the Spanish Civil, Civil War uh, was the largest territory ever to be governed by anarchist ideas. Um, and at the time, they were influenced by the writings of uh, Peter Kropotkin. So I think that they, this is really what I'm getting at is this. Um, these ideas, I mean, can we break out of, of the constraints that are going to kill us, maybe? Um, is that in blockchain? I don't know, but I do think there is something going on in blockchain that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, that's, I'll stop there. That's, that's my presentation. Thanks, Thanks. Rosemary. That's oh. great. Thanks, Rosemary. I have questions, but we'll let Wasim go. Okay. <laughs> so I just need to share my screen. I think Rosemary might have to stop sharing first. Okay. Do you need me to uh, click through or can I you can, do it yourself? I can reach. Wow. Can reach. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, that would be quite, a, um, quite an anecdote to say that I had a Zeta feminist uh, uh, clicking my slides. So probably need to share. So I'm probably going to take a bit of a step back, like we'll um, look on a kind of a, a grander scale. So hopefully we can all see uh, the slides. And so, um, yes, I spoke with Patricia. So first of all, thank you very much to, to Jesse and everyone else at 221A and to Patricia for, for uh, putting on this event, for inviting me here and uh, giving me the chance to, to um, speak a bit about some of the work that I've uh, done in the past and also that I'm, I'm doing at the moment uh, that, that, that meshes into um, looking at how um, you know the rubber hit rubber meets the road, how blockchains and these you know kind of technical structures that have these economic um, affordances and capabilities built in them, how these mesh with um, society, with our kind of um, uh, human lives, uh, with the um, social networks of networks, and um, and you know we can, I think we'll see some positives and some negatives, um, and uh, you know some unexpected. Um, uh, happenings and, and consequences. So I just, I'll start by explaining the picture on the on the slide, which is quite striking. So this is um, a bunch of combustion engines in shipping containers, uh, which are um, uh, powered by the strand, uh, flared, uh, flared methane gas from, um, which is stranded above fracking wells. Now you'll see this all over Canada. I believe this picture is actually from 
Um, it could be from Alberta, Saskatchewan. Um, it could, uh, it, I think this one might actually be from the States. Um, so what's happening in those situations is that there's a great deal of, um, uh, so the fracking wells are all in these kind of basins, which are very sparsely populated. And um, the gas, which comes off as a byproduct of the fracking for oil, is just flared off. They either burn it or it goes into the atmosphere unburned. And so some um, um, enterprising uh, Bitcoin miners have uh, decided to put mining rigs in these shipping containers to use some of this um, essentially kind of um, you know, waste gas. And you could actually argue in this circumstance that you know, contrary to what we think about as you know, Bitcoin mining being this uh, you know, uh, uh, only damaging, uh, only uh, negative, only regenerative negative externalities, this might actually be helping in a strange way uh, because unburnt methane going into the atmosphere is far worse from a kind of a greenhouse an emissions perspective than uh, combusted methane, carbon uh, dioxide. Um, and so, uh, but the, the point which I think we'll, we'll keep on coming back to is that proof of work networks, the, the networks which kind of like a blockchain 1.0, which things like the staking uh, paradigm, uh, which we've been hearing about just now, um, they don't care. These, these proof of work networks don't care where the energy comes from. It could be coming from solar energy. It could be coming from hydro dams. It could be the cleanest, most beautiful energy, or it could be coal. And it just doesn't care. And that's the that's the the point I want to to, to impress. And so um, we already had a little introduction about the salon, so I don't want to say too much. Uh, but just that we're preparing to do a series of events uh, discussing uh, Bitcoin and, uh, and and his friends and uh, and this um, its inability to reason about its externalities. And so uh, yeah, I will I will uh, slide straight along. And um, uh, yeah, we're talking about the necessity of value, and um, and uh, we already heard about the challenges of evaluating value in a in a specific sense, with reference to property. But um, I wonder if we can generalize this. And this is a, an old um, engraving from Abraham Bosse, I think, from the 17th century. And it's kind of this part of this movement of the um, uh, perspectivalism. I suppose it's in a way showing the inherent subjectivity and you know path dependence of our own uh, views, of our own uh, states of mind. And so what I've done here is I've tried to um, uh, uh, lay out some of the various kind of biases and lenses which you know it's particularly in the blockchain space but you know we, you know we're also humans as Patrick pattern recognizing creatures we see things through these um, you know we think we're seeing objectively sometimes we have biases which you are aware of and we have biases which we aren't and so we'll start from the right and we've got our, our observer here and uh, they see everything through their yeah, the eye of the beholder and so like we all have our own um, uh, uh, we come from different uh, schools of persuasion. We've been trained in different ways. We have this kind of epistemic baggage that we carry around and this colors the way we see things. And I think it's very interesting in the blockchain space where um, it's almost like Rorschach tests all the way down. So people see different things. As we just said about the infrastructure of mutualism and the digital metalism, um, and these are kind of mutually incompatible visions that people were um, projecting onto the same technological substrate. And we see this, this, this time and again. And so the next step over is Wittgenstein's ruler. Um, which, um, you know, uh, succinctly put, I suppose you could say is if you're not, uh, if you can't, if you don't have complete trust in your ruler and your measuring device, then as much, you're as much um, measuring um, the, uh, the measurer as you are the, um, the object. And then the next step over is Goodhart's law, which is a maxim used quite often in economics, which um, again, succinctly put is that when a, a measure becomes a metric, it ceases to be a good measure. And that's because people will optimize for a game for this thing. And we see this uh, really writ large in the blockchain space where we have this, um, you know, transparent, transparent and uh, fairly verifiable technical substrate. So we have a lot more data, a lot more information that we should be able to extract, scrape and, and learn from. Um, but um, the problem is sometimes that we don't always get the, the good information or that people know that everyone can see everything so that there's a bit of kind of obfuscation or you put on your best face on the surface and you carry on doing what you were doing in your own interests uh, underneath that. And then uh, right at the end on the very left, uh, you know, first it turned out we live in a society and now it turns out we live in a universe and that universe has kind of laws, um, constants and uh, this, this idea that everything is kind of homogenous and applies everywhere and that, you know, we're tending towards steady states and equilibria. And the one thing I learned from my 10 years in the, in the um, institution of science, a big, big S, is that none of these things really seem to be true. And so uh, I'll just, you know, I haven't got much time, but I'll just tell a very brief anecdote of um, the favorite, my favorite talk I saw uh, as, a, as a physicist, which was by John A. Popel III, who won a Nobel Prize for uh, discovering some of the um, important equations around quantum uh, mechanics related to chemistry. And his talk was called, Is Chemistry a Branch of Pure Mathematics? And uh, he was just standing at the front with a, a Sharpie and with an overhead projector and people were shouting out 
um, different um, universal constants and laws and equations. And he was just dismantling them and showing how much of a fallacy it was. So things like the speed of light had to be redefined so that it was constant, it was moving. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's the bedrock on which all of this is built. And so with that in mind, I, I appreciate that's not a very positive place to start, um, but I'm hoping that it will give us some kind of um, pause for thought as we go through. And so this is something that I think we're, we're quite well aware of by now, that, that Bitcoin is a, you know, it's a, uh, a protocol, it's a piece of software. Um, and then by computers uh, running that, they become a node in this network. And then those computers talk the same language to each other. Then they can transact and, uh, you know, and the token, the native value, it's also called Bitcoin, confusingly enough, little b. Uh, but the reason I mentioned this is that it's very helpful to have this kind of network uh, level perspective uh, because it helps us to compare and contrast things that are not so um, obviously networks. And so um, you've probably heard of Metcalfe's law by now. And if you haven't, you've certainly heard of Moore's law. So Metcalfe's law is basically the idea that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of nodes in it. And the example here is with telephones with Alexander Graham Bell. Imagine when he made the first telephone and he installed another one in his mother's, mother's house. I don't think that many of us would consider that to be a valuable global network. But as the thing scales, and then we, anybody can call anyone, we can see why that might be uh, more valuable. But there's a problem with uh, quadratic equations with n squared, which is that it just carries on to infinity. So that doesn't really make sense. Like eventually this network would ostensibly suck all the value out of the universe. And so uh, some people do call Bitcoin the black hole of money, uh, but I suppose that's probably not what they're getting at right now. And so, um, I want to just um, uh, propose a, an alternative frame of reference where we, we can think of almost every kind of exchangeable good uh, as a, a, a networked commodity. And if we think about it that way, then um, you can think of the, the way that the price is determined of a good in the moment of a transaction as the uh, conflation of some objective and subjective parameters. And um, uh, three of the key uh, things to consider are the redemption utility, the network utility, and the speculative utility. So the redemption utility is like you're using the thing. So an example of Ethereum, that could be you're using gas to run contracts, issue tokens, or what have you. Uh, and the network utility, this is like the Metcalf thing, how what a broad-based this network is, who will accept this thing from you. And we might not just be talking about money. We, can't, we might not just be talking about Bitcoins or dollars. We could be talking about tins of sardines in a prison. We could be talking about packets of cigarettes. We could be talking about a tasty fish you just got out of the sea. Um, and so with the fish, the redemption is you eat it. Uh, the network is who wants to buy that fish you just got out of the sea and the speculative utility to the i think i think don't think we need to um talk about that too much in the blockchain milieu we've all seen the markets in the last year um but the idea that the thing might be worth more tomorrow than it is today that is you know inherently what we're talking about here and we've spoken a bit about speculation in the blockchain space one of the things i'm extremely interested in is if there are ways that we can build anti-speculative anti-capitalist practices into these um networks and i've seen some initial examples uh, in the non-fungible token space art projects, which seem to be doing something along those lines. That's quite interesting. Uh, perhaps we have time at the end to, to discuss those. Those. And so one of the nice things about using this uh, network eye view is we can uh, then uh, uh, think about temporality as well. So in the past, like we know what the value of, for example, the price of Bitcoin was yesterday. That's a fact, you know, that's kind of recorded in the history books. In the moment, um, if I want to make a transaction right now with Patricia, um, that's an intersubjective thing we decide in the moment. Like, how, like we've had to find the number that we agree on to make the transaction. And we can't really know that until we engage. And in the future, it's anyone's, it's anyone's guess. And so again, we're moving between these objective and subjective uh, domains. And um, I just want to very quickly mention some, some work I was doing. Uh, we mentioned earlier this epistemic um, uh, framework that I built a few years ago. Well, I was uh, getting really fed up during the last um, kind of market mania of um, this was when the ICOs were the big thing. There wasn't DeFi and NFT so much. It was more ICOs, which was like a kind of a way to do kind of um, permissionless uh, capital fundraising for your token projects. And you raise the money up front so you don't have to build the thing, which is like great if you're raising money. And so um, I was getting upset with ICOs being lumped in with uh, altcoins and Bitcoin. Everyone's saying they're just the same and therefore regulators should see them as the same. I did not see that to be the case. So I tried to build a, a toolkit that um, uh, policy people like regulators and also asset designers could use to like disentangle the differences and similarities of these things and also to help them design them better um, so we could stop making so many mistakes. And I built this kind of vector space visual framework, which you're seeing a mock-up of, where we have these three um, kind of um, uh, overarching characteristics, one of which is moneyness, how much of a money something is, commoditiness, how much of a commodity something is, and securityness, which is to do with how securitized an asset looks. So something like an Apple share is a securitized asset. 
something that has cash flows, you're expecting profit, it's a speculative uh, vehicle. So the problem in 2017 is that people were making up things, making projects, saying they're not securities, but they kind of were. So they're trying to do this kind of uh, regulatory arbitrage, uh, trying to get around like these illegal externalities that these blockchains were kind of pushing onto uh, nation states, like I suppose you could say. Now, I won't go into this too much. Uh, like, so a lot of it is like um, tables and things like that. So I built a bunch of taxonomies uh, to try and understand, uh, to, uh, to try and categorize these things. And I attached some scores to the various kind of parameters and outcomes. And then those got squashed down with weighted indexes um, using this kind of mixture of subjective and objective um, uh, uh, parameters and views to come up with a kind of a 3D vector space where you could actually output something that you could show somebody that's not technical, uh, like a regulator or, or, or somebody else. And this is subjective, right? So this is my opinion um, and it's not objective. And people complained when I did it saying, I want something objective. And I was like, well, you can't have that actually. Uh, if you do, you're lying to yourself. That's the sort of, you're being a formalist and you're not acknowledging the, the, the reality or the epistemic gap between where your models and, and uh, what, how things outside look. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was um, that, that's some work that I did a few years ago. That's that's coming back now. I made some predictions, which um, which came true, and now some some people are looking back at this work, which is um, uh, always nice to know. Uh, I spent a long time doing it, and nobody read it at the time, so that's that's good. And so um, let's talk very briefly about um, these things as systems. Like, so Bitcoin is a is a system, and it has this hard boundary due to these validation requirements, so the cryptography, and also the kind of economic validation of um, of the longest chain. Uh, to understand uh, who's got what balances and so on. So the graph we're seeing here is the hash rate. This is the amount of thermodynamic energy, uh, uh, resource going in to defend the network. And this is one of the only graphs uh, to do with Bitcoin that is increasing faster than the price. So that's very interesting. It's, it's pretty much, you know, just goes up. Now, what, what oh, did we lose? oh, yes, that's, that's fine. So I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. I just want to say something, this is one of, one of my hot takes about Bitcoin, that I would say that the Bitcoin and proof of work more generally is essentially an inhuman monetary system. This is something that um, does not play well with humans. Uh, the lack of sensitivity of Bitcoin to its environs and its, its inability to reason about the energy, type of energy it takes in, uh, means that this thing is um, uh, essentially pitting capital and ecology against each other. And you know where we are in the in the planet in this you know in the Anthropocene and uh, with uh, the the global temperatures rising and CO two rising, um, the the danger is that you know Bitcoin may not be the thing that uh, uh, changes the climate balance by itself, but it could well be a tipping point. And I think this is something that um, needs to be acknowledged, um, especially within the Bitcoin space. And so. Um, in Bitcoin, we often talk about, um, so just to say between 2030 and 2020, I was banging the drum for Bitcoin. I was saying that the cost was worth paying because the benefit of having an uncensorable, unseizable, natively digital form of value transfer was worth it. And my family comes from Iraq and uh, uh, Saddam Hussein caused a lot of political and economic problems for them. And so when I saw Bitcoin in 2013, it immediately spoke to me, this, this affordance, this possibility, this libertari liberatory and emancipatory uh, potential. Um, however, the incentives are such within uh, Bitcoin, especially for the people that hold it, um, that um, I, I, and the transaction fees are, are, are quite high on, on many of the major networks now, that I don't see so much of this emancipatory potential anymore. I don't think Little Ali in the mountains of Afghanistan can use Bitcoin. And that was my hope for it. I was hoping that this could tilt the balance away from oppressive dictatorships and, and um, domineering uh, corporations. Um, and so uh, I won't go too much into this, but every time the price goes up, then the network needs more energy to defend it because of the way the economics are architected. And so uh, we always hear this about like, oh, solar, solar energy will save Bitcoin. It's mostly green energy. And what I will say is I know the people that write all these reports that all the Bitcoin is citing, they're all based on self-reporting. Self-reporting is susceptible to people um, uh, discussing their own interests rather than discussing in, in the interests of truth. And so like, we cannot really know what the energy mix of, of Bitcoin is, but what we can have is some clues. And so we're back to the hash rate graph and we're going to look at some fluctuations here. So these are quite large fluctuations. This is like 20 or 30% in you know, a matter of weeks or a week or two weeks. Now what's happening here is that Bitcoin is in some ways a nomadic system, or at least it has these kind of nomadic externalities. So in the, um, uh, the two seasons of Bitcoin mining, uh, in the winter, uh, so as you know, a great deal of the mining is done in China. So in the winter, a great deal of the China, uh, mine, mining in China is done in Shangchang, the Uyghur region in the West, um, very controversial region, obviously, uh, with coal. 
in the winter, it's very dirty. And in the summer, the, 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 the mining is done in the south in Sichuan with almost free hydropower from dams and, and, what, and the like. And so what's happening, these fluctuations are actually the mines unplugging from uh, uh, the south or the west and moving. And so what you actually see are these great migrations. And uh, the picture on the left uh, I just found recently, it blows my mind. It looks like a peasant farmer, uh, you know, going through the mountains with a bunch of uh, specialized computing hardware on his back. And so you see, that's why you see these pictures all the time of um, a, a crazy floods in these network, in these, um, in these mining farms, because they go to the flood seasons for the free hydro and they just take on too much water. So these are very real uh, examples of externalities uh, from Bitcoin. These aren't even really the first order ones. This isn't like, you know, the um, boiling the oceans. This is more just the kind of crazy fluctuations because of the um, heterogeneity of the energy market. And so there's, there's a lot of things like that. Here's another interesting example of a, another second order externality. This is a Welsh fellow. Uh, he says he mined with uh, Satoshi in 2009 and 10. He lost his hard drive, went to the dump in a poor town in Wales, and he's basically trying to buy the dump so that he can excavate it and find his Bitcoins. And so like, as the value of Bitcoin goes up, then this guy, like he says, he's gonna give the local council 50 million pounds to do it. Uh, and so like, this is like, you know, there are people in Bitcoin that have a lot of resources and they start to um, have these kind of uh, outsides influences on the outside world. And I call this necro primitivism. This is kind of the, the premise of proof of work and the belief in the, fa in the faith in cryptography and in uh, thermodynamics uh, trumps all else. Uh, to the point where um, nobody wants to imagine inside Bitcoin an alternative to proof of work. Uh, they would rather see the heat death of the universe in, 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 uh, in essence. And so I don't want to go into this too much. So these hot takes were covered in my uh, Chaos Computer Club uh, talk, the indifference engine uh, six months ago. And um, yes, in the interest of time, uh, we'll skip over. And so um, markets are also systems in a way and they have externalities of their own. And so we've all seen the markets go up and go down. And that's something that, um, uh, usually affects the um, uh, less savvy people than it does the, the insiders. So this is another kind of uh, anisotropy, another kind of uh, source of unfairness. And I just want to say, I know that we're running low on time, but I just want to say something about uh, the energy costs uh, related to things like tokenization, NFTs, because it was a very big topic over the last few months, a lot of hand-wringing on one side about um, uh, energy use, on, uh, from the mostly from the left, and a lot of people saying, you know, screw that, let the market decide on the right. And um, what I will say is about uh, marginal costs. So blockchains are very expensive to keep the lights on, especially proof of work ones. And so the amount of energy going into Ethereum just to keep the lights on, not tokenizing anything, is quite high. And so the marginal cost of putting a token out on Ethereum versus not doing it, it's actually quite small. Um, and then the one other thing just to say to relate back to proof of stake is that proof of work is very high on OPEX on variable costs, operating expenditure, uh, power, and so on. Whereas PO, uh, proof of stake requires specialized, a different kind of specialized equipment to generate the randomity, which doesn't come from the, um, the mining. And so there are like, you could argue that PO, proof of stake is shifting the cost back to CapEx. And CapEx is also centralized because you need to be able to build these machines. Um, as you, as uh, indeed you do with the, the, the uh, ASICs on, on Bitcoin. So there's kind of, there's complexities and there's um, gotchas uh, kind of all the way down. And I'll just say very briefly before we wrap that um, one of the most interesting things to look at in terms of um, uh, where this thing might be going or what the chinks in the armor of something like Bitcoin might be uh, as technological paradigms uh, change. And so um, over the years, there were developments of increasingly specialized computing hardware, but these things are not um, uh, uh, homogenous. So somebody will get this thing first and they'll have a massive advantage using it that might actually wreck a network. This has happened on other networks before. Um, and so there's this anisotropy there. Everything in Bitcoin is probabilistic. Um, so the cryptography that underpins the security is based on basically like the laws of large numbers and small probabilities. And uh, it's like an arms race. So we have to build new, better crypto cryptography to counteract um, uh, uh, more computing to, to code break. Um, then there's also this uh, idea of the 51% attack and the longest chain consensus. So if somebody puts more energy into the network, they can rewrite the history. So if I find, um, you know, if I invent cold fusion tomorrow, then Bitcoin's done because I have free energy and nobody else does. And so there are all of these kind of, um, you know, gotchas uh, that, are, that are going on. And I will just break by taking it to the limit, which is that, um, you know, Bitcoin requires a simple majority of all the energy it can see to know that it, to, to be secure, it doesn't know that it's secure. And so essentially, because of that, 
Uh, Bitcoin is in a competition with natural life for the harvest of energy on this side of the this side of the sun. And so this is my kind of um, clarion call and my, my challenge to, to Bitcoiners who only ever talk about the energy consumption in the present. And that's kind of like a non-event. We've seen that graph, that graph is just going up. So it doesn't make sense to talk about the present. We need to talk about the end game of Bitcoin. And there is no end game because it will never be sated. And so I will pretty much uh, wrap there and I hope we haven't uh, run over uh, time. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah. That was amazing. Um, all of you, um, Raoul and Rosemary and Patricia and Nassim. Um, so I think we'll have some time now for some discussion and some questions. Um, so for those of you who are with us, please um, please pose your questions in the Q&A window. And um, you also have the choice of asking your question with a live voice. We can bring in your mic if you'd like to have a bit of a follow up as well. So you can either choose to type or um, speak. Um, but I'm just wondering if anybody has any immediate questions um, from between the speakers to start. Rosemary. Uh, uh, Wasim would just... Uh... Thanks, it was such a fascinating presentation and um, I just wanted to comment. It's actually something Jesse shared with me by, uh, it's a tweet thread by Vinay, Vinay Gupta, who is one of the co-founders of Ethereum and he has this proposal to um, have energy reparations for all the energy that Ethereum has already um, um, yeah, destroyed or taken out. So I, I, I'm not sure if you're aware of that idea, but he has some kind of interesting ideas about where to how to move Ethereum forward. I, I don't know what to do about Bitcoin. <laughs> but, Bitcoin's um, hard. It's very hard because of the necro primitivist. Yeah. It's almost impossible to imagine a change. And if there's a change, remember it's blockchains, they just fork. And there will be like the necro primitivist chain and there'll be the whatever, you know, green chain. So um, when I gave the talk six months ago at CCC with a bunch of Bitcoiners watching, they were saying, we can just pay 1% to green the energy. And I was like, well, that's fine, but who, who, who says they did it and how can you prove it? And you know, we have also problems with kind of carbon markets and offsetting uh, in itself. And I suppose this um, reparations, climate justice idea of Binet is kind of like the, the extension of that. Um, so I like the idea, um, but I, I don't know how we would, it, it would be hard, it's hard to instantiate in reality. Yeah, I mean, I think he's being ambitious and he's, he's sort of saying, uh, this is great, but it's not why I joined the project, right? And trying to get it beyond. I mean, he made a really good comment about the whole unicorns, um, rainbows things. It's, it's sort of like masking a vacuum in, in what Ethereum stands for uh, at the present, which I thought was a, a very good observation. Yeah. But it's also a problem of the of scale, social scale. So Ethereum is now like this large social network as well as a technological one. And Vitalik did an interview just the other day, the Canadian co-founder of Ethereum. And uh, he was talking about how the biggest challenge with rolling out the, the massive upgrade, Ethereum 2 upgrade to, 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 to ETH was that it's a human coordination challenge. It wasn't so much the tech. Sorry. It's a good question here, Jesse. Should we um, should we take it about the anti-speculative, anti-capitalist mm. mechanisms? Um, so the example I wanted to mention yeah. was um, so we did a salon on non-fungible tokens recently, and some of our colleagues, uh, Sam Hart and Billy Renekamp, have an NFT project called Kudzu, named after the fast-growing Japanese vine. And uh, this is a project which um, you get the NFT through your social graph. You don't like you kind of ask for it, but then it arrives in your account, and you kind of then it's infected your. It's like a virus, NFT virus, it infects your account. And you can't send it. There's no transfer function. Um, so you can't sell it. You can't get rid of it. So then the question is like, what can you do with this thing? And so it sounds like this is now harder to speculate with. And I think this is opening up an interesting design space. But what you could do is you could sell the keys. You could sell your account, right? Because you've still got, it's a bit like you've got a house and you can't sell your house, but then you they put the house inside a company and then you can sell the company or something like that. Um, so the idea of not being able to transact or not being able to speculate, it's quite interesting. But I don't think it's um, a very well characterized space at all. Great. Morale, you have your hand up as well. Sorry, I gotta figure out how to undo all the stuff. Um, yeah, I think just you know, to um, add to that discussion, um, the kind of anti-capitalist, anti-speculative projects that are out there, um, like one that comes to mind uh, that I think is, is, is really effective um, is Bail Block, right? Um, and it's, it's essentially kind of 
using blockchains to um, uh, generate, uh, to mine cryptocurrency on, on any really computer to um, help raise bail funds for, for people, I think in the Bronx. Um, and, and there are a lot of projects like that, that, you know, don't necessarily get the same, I mean, just be, by virtue, I think of being anti-speculative and anti-capitalist and, and really rooted in kind of a, a more of a maybe anarchist um, positioning um, and, and mutual aid just don't trend the same way that, oh, look, I had someone give me five Bitcoin seven years ago, and now I've, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go buy a Lambo or something. Um, so I think there's also kind of this, this um, the discourses are really interesting to think about in terms of kind of um, what projects are out there and, and how they get taken up. Um, and just kind of to, to refer back to kind of, um, you know, ETH and, and Ethereum in particular, which has become really widely institutional. Um, that space also kind of um, leaves a little room, I think, for these types of anti-speculative um, initiatives like the one that uh, Wasim just mentioned as well, because you're not going to, that's that's not what's going to get into a boardroom. <laughs> that's not what's going to get into Bloomberg nearly as um, as much, right? As as something that's going to to kind of reproduce the the kind of uh, capitalist rules of engagement as we know them. There's actually two problems, I think. Though there's the one problem of not being able to generate interest in the project, and there's a second yeah. problem of uh, just being able to get your damn transactions on the chain. Yes. Because if you're a less financial project, you will have less money to spend on the fees, which is why first it was Bitcoin, now it's Ethereum. Financial stuff is just pushing out the non-financial stuff because financial stuff can pay. Maybe can I can I raise a question perhaps that is like, because the thing that is really striking in hearing, hearing you, who I consider to be fairly having a high degree of competence, let's say, I don't want to use the word expertise, but competence background knowledge is like one part of the essay that I couldn't get to which Morel had briefly mentioned was this uh, picture of uh, what Anna Longo had written about about the global game and, in the, and so basically she's she's addressing uh, the the way that information becomes uh, you know based it's based on a bioevolutionary model first of all um, but second of all it's the way that it kind of handles information as and the only sort of function of in information is to leverage it for uh, the advantage which manifests as network centralization, right? And so the when I was trying to make, make analogies in my, let's say, analog brain, <laughs> in my simple brain <laughs> to what you guys were saying, was like, uh, first is like, um, in this global game issue, there's a deliberate uh, uh, design of a asymmetric access to information, mm -hmm. right? Already, like, I'm not, it's not like I've never heard of blockchain or anything and I've read about it. I've read some of my brilliant colleagues works on it. And a lot of what you're discussing, I, I would have no idea tangibly what to do, go home tonight and like, how would I become active? I'm not saying I want to, I'm just saying I would still have, the, the level of informational entry or accessibility to it, it seems highly stacked, right? Um, so there's that side of it. And then the other side that I want to know is that, again, to kind of bring it to Anna Longo's model of this global game, but I just found it very helpful. Um, as, as a kind of a st structure to keep in my head was uh, again, the way that that game is designed towards monopoly clustering, which to me links to network effects, right? And that's like a huge issue in tech is like, you could develop the best thing on the planet. Uh, if you don't have enough users, then it, it's worth nothing, right? And it seems to me that, um, and so I was curious about, and uh, maybe this goes to Rosemary, like to keep that general observation in mind, but then a more pointed question to Rosemary to maybe um, explain if you think there's a difference between what you were talking about uh, in terms of the, the, okay, how should I say it? How the token, if I understood correctly, the token holders are also involved in the protocol production or they're, they're endorsing the protocols. Do they have governance possibility or are they only allowed to invest in the sense that I could buy a ton of stock. It doesn't mean that I have like option to decide on uh, the company. And then what would be the difference between that type of system and just general network effects, which are to me related to the imitative uh, adaptive systemic operation that I was getting at from, uh, from winter. So it may be, and, and it's just to kind of more clarify if you see a distinction between them. Yeah. Um yeah, great question. And um, I would go back to something Wasim said about uh, Bitcoin being, I don't know what the term was you used, but because um, you had quite a few, but I mean, 
Bitcoin itself, that's not not the governance is you just vote with your your dollars just like any other business, right? Um, or or it has governance in terms of forks, and that's also it's this it's meant to operate a, a, on as this automaton or something. So that's that's sort of not the point. And that, but then e, e, Ethereum brought in uh, smart contracts, so that enabled people to think of uh, yeah the governance. But yeah, there's a question of like for good or bad whether governance is is actually uh, the point. Um, uh, yeah, and it, it Bitcoin operates. It's just like hard hardcore capitalism for sure. You know, yeah, it's. I, it's just my observation was just that it allows new entrants to come in and 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 in in a direct way that I that I find interesting and um, uh, yeah just just that that feedback loop of of you can put money into it and take money out <laughs> in in this very direct way like I just think it's very it's very unusual right like, yeah. I think that's the thing that Bitcoin is going for is its simplicity in all of these ways. So proof of work helps it stay simple because a lot of the complexity is outside. And that's why all these proof of stake systems that are being built now are so much more complicated. And so Bitcoin has a kind of minimized governance surface, you could say. There's almost no way to do kind of governance but apart from signaling inside the network. So that relies on people basically gathering outside. And that's why we get things like Bitcoin foundations, Bitcoin associations. The latest one is Michael Saylor and Elon Musk saying they're going to talk to the miners to green Bitcoin. I'm like, well, great. We just got two tech bros that are putting themselves leaders of Bitcoin. That's yeah, decentralized. And so, um, you know, we have this that's off-chain governance. And the, but then off, on-chain, which is the, alter, the alternative, which is not quite what Ethereum is doing, but newer networks are doing this. There's also problems there. Because again, like who controls the coins, who knows how the protocol works, they have this huge advantage. And I, I did some research on, on this uh, a few years ago, and I, um, I found uh, in the masternode networks, which are these kind of multi-tiered hierarchical node networks, um, I started meeting the developers from them, and they started saying to me, oh my God, thank God somebody's looking at this. It's a cartel, it's a dictatorship, it's a, you know, a ligopoly, and nobody can see it. And there's all this voting and there's DAOs and everything's like, looks very, you know, egalitarian. Under the surface, it's just the same old. I think, Absolutely. you know, sorry. No, I'm just going to say just that. Go ahead, Morel. <laughs> all right. I was just going um, to bring it back to Patricia's question, I think, about kind of, um, and, and maybe I misread it but or misheard it, but, you know, the kind of level of obscurantism <laughs> um, kind of wrapped around these types of protocols and, like, how do you make sense of it in a tangible way? Um, I think with Steve and, and, and Rosemary's points just kind of demonstrated that, I think, to some extent of... Um, the fact that, uh, and, and to go back to kind of that first decision information asymmetry point that I think you make in your paper, um, often it's, you know, though Bitcoin is extremely elegant and, and, and quite simplistic in some ways to, to Rosemary's point, um, it's also really complicated and being complicated isn't a good thing necessarily and, and quite challenging. Like, so yeah, you can put money in and take it out. But um, if anyone's ever done that, um, practically speaking, depending on how you did that, right? So if you use kind of a third party custodial exchange, so like an like maybe manages your money okay um or your your crypto okay then um that can be a little bit dicey um or if you do kind of a cold wallet uh that can itself has its own like you have to essentially kind of um uh take the liability of managing your own funds um and if you don't have legal expertise um if you uh for put where, for instance, <laughs> um, or if you, like me, thought you were being really smart by like air gapping everything and, you know, writing your little um, mnemonic phrases on, on post-its that you locked up in your cabinet and your four-year-old gets the keys and eats it, um, then, you know, you've just lost <laughs> all your funds. And so, I, and, and maybe I think, that's... Yeah, I, just to say very quickly on that point, sorry to interrupt you, I believe that at this point, far more money has been lost in these crypto systems <laughs> by people losing access to their coins by keep trying to keep them safe than they were stolen or whatever. Yeah, precisely, right? And, and, and you know, those information asymmetries in some ways are quite, they're funny when they don't happen to you, right? Like the, this example, which was real, that I just described. Um, but in other cases, it can be quite damaging and, and um, dispossess and, and really bizarre and, and, and um, big ways. Like, so for instance, your example with seem of um, um, the fella who uh, was trying to, to buy, essentially get into the landfill to get his, his Bitcoin, um, or people who are essentially kind of trying to 
you know, uh, continue some form of financial abuse because, oh, I'm keeping the, the keys in my head, right? Um, so I think, yeah, there's kind of this interesting contradiction that it really um, continues to operate and where that Bitcoin in particular seems really simple. It seems like a nice solution. And I think that's why it's so in, um, seductive to a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, once you start kind of playing with it, um, you see kind of all of the risks and, and liabilities that come out and all of the, yeah, the, the way that information is leveraged to um, create kind of these coteries or cabals or, or um, cartels to use Wasim's term um, that just kind of intensify capitalism as we know. Yeah, also there's an, also a massive incentive from the people that are, you know, uh, within the network associated with it to present the thing as being very easy to use and very simple to use. Now I've been using Bitcoin since 2013. I'm still terrified every time I make a transaction and uh, it hasn't got any better. Mm -hmm. Like I do know what I'm doing, but like I'm still terrified. Uh, so the, 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 the difficulty curve is real. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Rosemary and I were talking to another um, artist and um, crypto developer, um, Sarah Friend, who's based in Berlin. She's working on a crypto UBI project, but she said, yeah, one of the biggest barriers to mass adoption is going to be, can people remember a key phrase? And how are we going to sort out this very analog problem um, for everybody to get on with it? Um, and Tao, um, our program producers, brought forward examples of people like engraving key phrases and metal and storing them in safety deposit boxes at banks, which doesn't seem like that horrible of an idea at this point. Are you um, trusting the bank again? I thought the point was we were going to be our own <laughs> banks, not like we have to take our password to the bank. Totally. Um, but we have one more question coming in from um, Daniel Schindbaum. Um, and he asks any of the panelists, how do you see the research Patricia represented, which only briefly touches directly on blockchains, is relating to crypto? How does it shed light on crypto? I'm thinking mostly about crypto's role in retooling, but feel free to take it in any direction you'd like. I believe that's addressed to the three of you. <laughs> we should mention that Daniel is one of uh, Wasim's co-conspirators at the Salon. So shout out to him. But um, I think he was talking to the people who know about crypto and not to me. <laughs> Spoke around it. I mean, I'm happy to start um, saying some things and I'm sure uh, our, my wonderful panelists will jump in and, and say more eloquent things. Um, give some time to this process. Um, I actually think, you know, um, it, again, like I actually find Patricia's research extremely compelling um, as someone who um, has spent a long time in this space researching and, and working and, and using crypto um, because it's not deliberately focused on the crypto component or even the blockchain component. And I think um, it's, it's, there's a lot of, um, when you think about kind of what it can do, I think it really uh, surfaces, it, it cuts past a lot of, I think, the kind of more dominant discourses that we hear about. So the things that are all about, you know, HODL, your money, and this is just a speculative engine, um, or even kind of the, the, a lot of the hype around NFTs is a good example where people are just seeing it as kind of a, uh, an option for them to, you know, lower the barrier to entry for, for some kind of finance and, and get theirs. Um, but I think, you know, Patricia's work really prompts uh, people who are working in this space and, and, and should read it um, to think about, okay, but like what actually does it, like what are the imaginaries that we can kind of enact here? Um, what is possible? And I think a lot of people are doing that work. So some of the projects that I think folks mentioned, including, um, you know, that are, they're maybe anti-capitalist um, and, and not lose sight of that because ultimately, you know, we can, we don't have to be stuck in this path dependency in terms of kind of what crypto is. And I, I think that's some of what I'm hearing from Wasim in particular, where, you know, being in the space since 2013 or thereabouts, um, yeah, you kind of get in and you get really excited. And, and, and that's one of the things that compelled me as well is like, okay, like this is something that might provide an out, might provide some alternative. Maybe, you know, there's some hope here. Um, you know, someone who kind of, I think I graduated my undergrad the day that Lehman Brothers crashed, right? So for, people like me and, and, and probably many others um, are kind of um, in place and in flesh positions um, really kind of when you see some opportunity for, for change, um, it's, it's really compelling. And so I think Patricia's work is really important because it reminds us not to get depressed <laughs> when we see um, the way that, that crypto has kind of evolved. Um, and, and it is in some ways very depressing, right? To, to be in those circles with tech bros who um, you know, just wanna eat steak all day um, and are, are perhaps not the most generative um, and, and that there are alternatives. And I think that's one of the realities if you work in this space in any capacity is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a, like any other, it's an industry full of contradictions. And those same dudes who are jerks um, and eat steak are, are also in other ways really generative sometimes. And, and it's really 
confounding. Um, and I think Patricia's work really forces us to think about that. Um, and those other spaces, those intimate spaces, those nomadic moments, I think to, to riff off of Wasim's notion um, that, that, you know, as subjectivities and, and positions were not stable. Um, and that if we think about that, maybe, maybe we don't have to be, you know, carnivorous incels all the time. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. But I think that, yeah, that definitely goes back to some, you know, back to the tweet that um, that Rosemary mentioned by Vinay Gupta, but I think what he was criticizing was like how if, like Wasim was saying, that there's still something beneath Ethereum that needs work. Like there's a really great performance and Vinay kind of called it um, an ideological vacuum, which was quite a, quite a prescription for Ethereum. So it's kind of been, you know, this idea of governance uh, in the collective is a nice idea, but in the protocol yet, it's still not there. And it's just kind of replaced by this optimism of Nyan cats and unicorns. And so Patricia's work is obviously something more than Nyan cats and unicorns. And I think like working with artists like Patricia and thinkers like Wasim and, and yourself, Morale, help us construct a bit of an idea of what that, mm, what we can fill that void with or start building out that void with. And that's the hope of this project too, is to try and help develop civil society around this tech because it's sorely missing. Um, and hopefully we're inspiring other institutions. Like, yeah, we're looking at it as an institutional technology, but not to institutionalize it, if you know what I mean. So it's more so like, how do you develop, like the markets are not just de facto things. They don't just exist because of nature, right? And I think that's what Patricia's paper is showing us. So it's kind of like the markets are outcomes from all of our institutions behaving the way they do. So we're looking for other outcomes, which means retooling institutions, which means retooling everybody who works in them and thinking through those thoughts differently. Yeah, and, and for me, like, um, you know, having been sort of sitting here watching the space growing, you know, at, at a clip and seeing uh, different kinds of people uh, coming in, um, even though the diversity of the people in the space has changed a lot, I do still feel like, you know, we are missing a lot of um, imagine, imagination and, and uh, brave, braver um, uh, uh, possibilities. And, uh, you know, we have these amazing substrates for experimentation. I believe blockchain is a fantastic uh, toy model systems that we can try anything out, new economic paradigms, new sociopolitical ones, new governance paradigms. Um, so, but, but what we need is the imagination from, from the broader sphere to get away from this markets all the way down uh, techno solutionism. Yeah, that, that, um, that's the thing about blockchains is, is it's kind of this, uh the utopianism um max is is was always kind of so simplistic um but i do think there's something there that's that like in this idea of co coordinating people and people can be self-coordinating that that yeah i think there's something there but i also am aware of all the ways in which it's become it, gets complicated so quickly and, and um, uh, which is just normal. Like that's just normal. It's like the new utopian thing. And, and then, yeah, there's a it curves down into sort of a, a reality of, of like human complexity and the complexity of like human, human relationships. But um, I think that uh, Patricia's text, if you take the time in, it, you, it's really like answering inside a, a world of this kind of luminous, like Matryoshka dolls of, of like revealing um, structures of, of, of that we're thinking inside. Um, and it can be very helpful in, in seeing the contours of that, which is, which is like what the best sort of like deep, you know, philosophical texts, that's, that's what they do. So, um, yeah. Great. Are there any other questions coming from the attendees? Any other questions coming from the panelists, just because we're coming up at about two hours now? Mm -hmm. Patricia, did you have something? Yeah. Um, not really a question. I just think like, I mean, I think so many of the things that were discussed, like, um, they just they have so many points of resonance right like when you when you're talking about the kind of inability of the um blockchain networks to kind of 
reason their externalities. I mean, to me, that's just, that's what capitalism is also not the best at reasoning externalities. So it's in effect just kind of mirroring, it's an adaptive uh, expression or adaptive artifact of that, of that fact as well. Um, but I think, uh, no, I think I don't, I don't have any questions. I feel like I have a lot to learn on a lot of these, um, a lot of these topics. I think the last, the only thing that I just wanted to kind of pick up a little bit on what Rosemary said was the thing that after I was reading the Simon Dome more closely uh, last summer when I was writing it, it struck me as well that the, um, I felt, I was starting to come to the conclusion that of course, like in a lot of the humanities, the utter dismissal of sort of novel, novel technology, calling it like, oh, you know, with the solutionist claim that Yevgeny Morozov um, uh, quip, which is very helpful to describe a certain culture around technology, right? That, that's like more, much more, I think, the Californian ideology, sort of known as the Californian ideology. But it struck me as well that, is that not a similar impulse when you are, if you're expecting technology to be the easy, quick fix? On the other hand, if you are immediately dismissive of technology that just emerges because it doesn't fulfill all its revolutionary claims or however you want to call it, all its like productive disturbance claims, then isn't it also falling into that same uh, trap of immediacy? Because it seems to me the temporality of that, of that chastising via solutionism, again, completely legitimate, but there's a temporality there that is similar to the utter dismissal. And so I'm curious about like how we're going to come to adjudicate this process of, of, you know, legitimate critique like you know this kind of energy thing is a real problem you know and that needs to be addressed but versus also allowing things like recognizing the nascent state of something and that it's also in an early stage of um development and how can it be you know how how can we come to adjudicate that which, which may be harmful that which is just stupid gadgetry that what may have you know more uh, possibility that we can't yet imagine, you know what I mean? Like there's a really de delicate threshold there, but it struck me that that, that, that demand that, uh, that, you know, the quip against solutionism mm -hmm. as equally with the quip that, oh, this thing just is like fall, you know, it's not fulfilling its promise. It's blocked in that same temporality of immediacy and we have to let go of that. We have to ask, I have to, have to ask who decides yeah. the political question mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a really good, um, uh, comment in uh, Jesse and I did a, um, a look the launch of the publication with uh, Svetlana Mat Matienko who's from SFU and when we met with her in advance she um, does work on um, civil society and networks that's her area of study and she was saying to us well that these you know before this um, it's sort of the flip side of what you're saying, Patricia, mm -hmm. is that before there was the utopianism around blockchain, there was the utopianism around the internet. It, it, these claims get keep get keep being made over and over again. Like you can you can follow that path, and it's for some reason they, they it's, it's also like the flip side of what you're saying. They sort of like die this quick death, um, and then something else comes along, and, they, and it gets repeated again. So. Yeah. I could very quickly posit a possible explanation for that, which is that we seem to continually try to use technology to solve human and social problems. So every time a new technology comes along, we're like, oh, social problems, let's fix them with this. And then we obviously see, get to the other end of that, and then we need to find some more technology to try that again with if we're solutionists. Yeah, yeah I think that you just nailed it. Uh, it's the desire to solve big problems really quickly. Um, and then feeling let down by it. <laughs> um, but it's it's definitely, I think that notion of um, uh, being really critical um, and maybe kind of being dismissive of, of new technologies, um, Patricia, is something that's, that's real. I see kind of reproducing itself across a number of sectors. Um, and it's really challenging if you've seen those failures um, firsthand, especially with blockchains, um, to not fall into that, I think, critical trap all the time mm -hmm. and to say, okay, how do we thoughtfully experiment? Um, what is like, and, and, you know, especially in the context of institutions, I think that's something that a lot of, um, a lot of governments are really struggling with. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you go down this institutional route, then you have, I think you have more of a chance because you're trying to, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, conduct the experiments without um, letting them denigrate into investments, which seems to be the problem that these things turn into investments straight away. Mm -hmm. And then they just rip themselves apart because of the incentives. Yeah. yeah. 
conversely though, you have the, the liability and risk that like getting a project off the ground um, in an institutional context, government, uh, kind of maybe a, uh, a liberal government for so to say in the Western context is a lot more challenging because then you end up potentially causing harm um, to your end users who are your constituents. And also um, if you abandon the project or if you run out of like to point, I, I like the way you frame capital and operational fund in, in the way that um, you presented that, but it's this big question of like, okay, you got the funding for three years, now what? Um, and if you have an unmaintained repo and then someone else uses it, um, but you know, it's associated with a particular institution that, that causes its own harm, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, Patricia. And I think it's probably an entire research project someone should do on it. Yeah, just very quickly, we did a salon on algorithmic realism uh, last year, and one of the topics that came up was you know, a developer writes some code, they put it on a repo, somebody else puts that inside a program, and then like goes off and does some harm. Like, where does the liability sit? Mm. Like, developers are terrified that they'll um, be held on the hook for something they didn't even implement in the mm -hmm. past. Yeah. So there's it's very a, problematic. There's such a great article by Susan Shipley on this problem in a legal context where uh from from uh, radical philosophy it's online you can if you're curious on that legal liability thing i can highly recommend that essay from susan shipley she was it's in the context of like uh the context is something like ai drone strikes so mm -hmm. when there's nobody operates like the experiment of like a facial recognition drone strikes so the machine decides on itself it will for sure produce some uh, very- It's happening now, Patricia. This week, there yeah. were un unmanned Turkish drones uh, hunting Haftar's troops in Yemen. Mm. So the happening. question is like, the if it like, when it makes a mistake, like when, it drone, when it's gonna drone strike a wedding and not a uh, so-called terrorist cell, mm -hmm. like who's accountable? And when you get into the production chains of these, of these uh, very multi-authored systems, right? Um, it's like, where does the liability lie? Because it's kind of a way that it escapes the conventions of the way we ascribe liability in the current legal system, uh, at least the current like Western legal system. So it's a very, very compelling case, but um, can recommend. Sure. Uh, blockchains are also uh, potentially provenance or liability obfuscation or like uh, you know, degranularization uh, vehicles as well. So um, I suppose we have to be um, attuned to watching out for people using them in that way. I think Tao just put the, the, the article, it's in the, in the chat there. Oh, Thanks. Great. Tao. Yep. Yeah. great, I'm glad you found it. That'll be hopefully, uh, yes. Thank you, Tao, very kind. <laughs> great. <laughs> well, um, if there's no more questions, maybe we can sign off here. So thank you, Patricia, for working together for the past two years, really, which is what this text started before the pandemic. But this is what this is publishing and writing and thinking time. And this is what we're here to support. So thanks for joining us on that and bringing together this group of folks to kind of work through the paper with us, because it's a paper that I recommend people send, spend some time with, like Morale said, and it's something that I go back to and helps reorient as I'm thinking through this, because, of course, this project is something that continues for 221A. We still have two more years of funding morale in an institutional context to see what we can do and hopefully build some um, some some civil society and bring some partners along with this, which is where we'll keep working with us. Um, but on that note, I will give a plug too to some upcoming events um, for our series. Um, so we've finished uh, our work with Patricia today, um, but Morale is going to join us again on Friday, June 18th, so two weeks from today. Um, and we'll do a group discussion around housing and platform cooperatives, more specifically on um, uh, Morale's paper. Um, and we'll be joined as well by Doma, who was a research partner of um, 221As on this, and they continue working with us as a fellow. As well, we'll have Andy Yan, who's the um, director of Simon Fraser University City Program. And um, Andy's doing some incredible research right now on the secondary and informal rental market in Vancouver, which he's estimating to be over 50% of the rental market. Um, and that's early research, but we wanna understand where that's coming from as we think about what's possible with housing, as well as we'll have Ian Spangler, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Kentucky. And he's a, um, he's a, he's a geographer as well. And he'll, he's been studying um, platform real estate since Airbnb to now. And so he's got some, some 
some advice for us to share. And then finally, um, on June 25, we'll release a, an edited recording of a roundtable that we just um, held yesterday, actually. Um, but we're looking at the, at the development space of um, social tokens and DAOs. Um, and that was with new models. Um, Albiverse, who's a writer and works as the head of community for super rare um, Say DAO, which is an amazing quadratic voting open source um, kind of blockchain project. Folia, a great uh, digital NFT um, gallery space. Um, Black Swan, uh, which is a which is a DAO operating out of trust. Um, we had Neil Belufa, uh, artist in Paris, um, as his production company Bad Manners, working on some tokenized projects. Circles UBI and um, Rosemary Heather. So um, if you sign up to our newsletter, you'll get a notice of that um, of that um, final event, which will be our final act of this launch series. Um, so you can find out more at our website 221a.ca. So thank you everyone, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your days and uh, your evenings. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Thanks Jesse, for everybody. all the support and collaboration over this long two years. <laughs> yeah. My pleasure. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks Bye. So Thanks. Ciao. Ciao. Cheers. Bye. Ciao.